Okay, welcome everyone. Um, we're just going to start this session on uh, a long, hard look evaluating civic tech as a field. Um, so I'd like to just uh, introduce for the first speaker, uh, Rosie McGee from the Institute of Development Studies in the UK, who's going to be talking about the Making All Voices Count program. So worked on the program with me. Um, hello, everyone. So we're going to uh, talk about the Making All Voices Count program. I am assuming a little bit of prior knowledge about the program, just a little bit, because I didn't want to spend a lot of time talking about the mechanics of the program when what we're trying to focus on is evaluating impact in this field. So I'm using the program as an example, but not planning to go into details on the program. Um, the program was designed in the wake of the Arab Spring. Uh, mainly over, over 2012, uh, with very big and broad aspirations. The programme aspired to opening up government, to closing the feedback loop, creating more effective democratic governance and accountability all around the world, enabling all people, including the poor, to engage, to call to account public and private institutions on policy issues that matter to them. These are all quotes from the initial programme documentation. It's a very ambitious programme. Um, we had a very large um, innovation and scaling re-granting side to the program and a research evidence and learning component which Duncan and I worked in, which IDS led on. Um, the program came to an end at the end of, sorry, at the end of um, 2017. And by that time we had made 178 grants to different projects, innovation, scaling and research projects, and produced 120 research and evidence publications, all available on the website. But for your ease of access. Yes, yeah, sure. Sorry. Ah, you heard that, didn't you? Thank you. Um, thanks. So uh, there's a very handy synthesis of findings, which is also available on the website up there on the left hand side, and also a handy synthesis of operational lessons, which is much more about the lessons of running a program like this, the programmatic operational side of things. So rather than restate the lessons which are already there in all those publications and summarized here in these synthesis documents about best practice in devising tech solutions, um, and rather than talk about tech solutions to discrete information-related problems in service delivery, which were a lot of the programs, a lot of the projects that MABC funded were about that, we want to focus on two things in this session. Firstly, the potential and limits of technologies in the much more transformative project of laying the foundations for democratic and accountable governance or deepening uh, the degree of, of um, democratic and accountable governance. And secondly, the extent to which a donor-funded program like Making All Voices Count actually incentivizes and rewards the kind of careful, critical, evaluative approach that lots of us might be committed to. I want to just make the caveat before we go into to detail that this isn't in any way an, an intention to apportion any blame or to discredit any of the actors involved in the program from the donors downwards. Um, what we want to do is just a, a very brief sort of program level retrospective assessment of what the program reveals about some of the common challenges of assessing uh, the impact of civic tech work. In this case, exemplified by what was a very large and complex multi-donor funded program that was managed by a diverse consortium of actors that was working under intense delivery pressures in the context of a very, very rapidly shifting uh, aid environment in the UK, which is relevant because DFID was the lead donor uh, that, was, that we were reporting to in a sort of monitoring evaluation sense. Um, so <clears throat> the session, I think we need to just remind ourselves, is about evaluating civic tech as a field, which to me means evaluating what the tech achieves for the civic of evaluating the governance impacts of civic tech efforts. And governance as the field within which all accountability and transparency and openness work lies is a very broad and diverse field. And some of us who come to civic tech conferences come from that field and some come much more from the technology side. I come from the governance field. Um, it's a field which has always been recognized as posing particular problems in attempts to assess impact. And there have been a space of really good publications from applied academic researchers, from INGO policy people, from official aid agencies and philanthropic um, foundations over the past decade or so, which really places governance very firmly among the complex areas of programming that are particularly challenged by the evidence-based turn that has affected the aid landscape over that same period. Um, 
these works and then lots of investments in, in some of the challenges that these works show have been really kind of expanding the range of approaches and methods that are available to, to impact evaluators and assessors in the governance field. So before I ever worked on tech in governance, around seven or eight years ago, I worked with a colleague on a review of the impact and effectiveness of transparency and accountability initiatives. And at that stage, hardly any of the initiatives that we reviewed were tech-based initiatives. And we talked about impact and effectiveness as separate but connected. And we defined effectiveness as whether initiatives were implemented as planned. And we defined impact as being about what they achieve, pointing out that transparency and accountability initiatives often seek quite varied uh, objectives in themselves, right through from developmental kind of material benefits of development type objectives through to democratic objectives through to citizen empowerment type objectives. Um, and the reason we found it useful to distinguish these was that uh, they're different but connected. And in a, in a sensible theory of change, you would have both. You would have the inputs that are meant to have an effect of a certain kind. And then you would have a series of assumptions holding those together in a theory of change, which, if they all hold good, mean that the things which are going on as inputs and outputs which are effective all add up to the outcome and the impact. Um, tech approaches might well be effective within tech's own terms and within their own parameters, or they might not be. I'm sure we can all think of tech uh, initiatives that haven't been. But when you look at them from a civic tech perspective, what I want to argue is the question that's relevant is not that. It's not about whether they are effective within their own parameters. The relevant question is whether they had any impact on the underlying governance problems that might have given rise to the service delivery deficit or to the lack of opportunity for citizen voices to shape policy or to the unclosed feedback loops that might need remedying by technological fixes. So it is important to know whether the tech was effective and that might be part of the impact story but it's not the answer to the impact question. As we argued in 2010 in that piece of work I was talking about in relation to transparency and accountability impacts in general, the best approach to, un to, to understanding governance impact is to use a theory of change type approach, a theory-based approach to evaluation that identifies and examines all of the assumptions that are supposed, assumed, to link inputs and outputs and outcomes and impact. And the hierarchies in a governance program or a governance project, the, the interrelationships between those can be quite complex and the assumptions can be quite buried. And a theory-based approach to evaluation, which has been around for a long time, but on which there's, there's been a lot of publication and work in the governance sector over the last decade or so, is in my mind the best way to do it. So that's the theory out there, but then let's talk about making all voices count. Um, in synthesizing all of the lessons from the Making All Voices Count program into that publication up there about appropriating technology, we found it useful to differentiate between sort of clusters of messages that relate to different clusters of things that we funded and things that we saw from the things that we funded. Um, on the one hand, tech solutions to discrete service delivery problems. The program funded a lot of those, perhaps especially early on, um, with innovation grants. And there's a, whole, there's a block of three messages in, the, in that synthesis report that refer to you know, how technologies can play decisive roles if the problem is a lack of data or planning information, common design flaws that tech for transparency or tech for accountability initiatives often fall into, um, and how obviously transparency and information and openness are not sufficient in themselves to generate accountability. Then there's a second block of messages which are about attempts to apply technologies to some of the broader, more systemic type governance challenges. Again, a number of uh, projects funded by MABC were of this type. And here there's some messages which, for me, who had come at this program from quite a skeptical perspective, were, were, were new and were interesting and were refreshing. So recognition that technologies really can support social mobilization, they really can support collective action by connecting up citizens. They can open up and hold open new spaces for engagement that might not have existed before between government actors, state actors, and citizens. And they can help to empower citizens and to strengthen their agency for, for engaging with actors more powerful than themselves. And then there was a third block of lessons, which are more about the much more transformative and difficult and long-term project of building democratic and accountable governance, really laying those foundations where we had to say, we found that technologies in themselves actually currently contribute very little. It's not to say they're not there, of course they're there, because technologies are here in all of our everyday lives and in 
the everyday lives of, of governance advocates and activists in, in countries all over the world, but that the actual contribution of the technologies to that governance impact was pretty much limited. Uh, not to say it will always be like that, there's potential for further developments that, that might mean that, that that changes, but that's what we had to say at the moment. So um, we, um, I think we, we need to conclude from the body of MAVC evidence overall that solving those discrete information problems in service delivery using technologies might achieve the aims of the tech initiative, but that the aims of a tech initiative, if they are at all realistic, and many of the proposals that were put to us in MAVC stated quite unrealistic objectives to start with, but if they are at all realistic, they tend to stop a long way short of laying the foundations of democratic accountable governance systems, which might be fine. You need things to happen at all levels, but there was, there's been a very strong tendency in the field, as we all know, for overclaiming in terms of the objectives of, of tech projects. But the problem that I think we all really need to focus on is it's much easier and much quicker to assess the effectiveness of tech solutions, so those tech effects, and to capture those in quantifiable indicators in the short term than it is to assess the governance impact of initiatives that might use technologies along with other approaches as part of a much more complex strategy to make much more complex changes happen in governance systems. And sometimes what gets monitored or evaluated is the easier thing to monitor or evaluate rather than the most relevant thing. So I'm going to hand over to Duncan to give some illustrations from Making All Voices Count of how these tensions played out. Oh, sorry, this is my one about foundations, sorry. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Rosie. Um, so I just wanted to start at the original theory of change behind the program. Okay, so going back to 2012, uh, four donors sat in a room, developed quite a complex theory of change that guided the development of the program. Um, this theory of change contained assumptions about governance which were well grounded in the kind of cutting edge of governance literature that existed at that time. Um, but there were also many assumptions in there that um, were more around the potential of technologies to play roles in governance. So um, at that time, there was a lot less evidence on that aspect of the theory of change. And actually, if you look at it, that some of these were more kind of wishful thinking rather than um, you know, evidence-based assumptions. Um, so part of uh, Rosie and myself's role as um, leading the research evidence learning component um, had to include testing some of these tech assumptions that were built into that theory of change. And that was to kind of, kind of seek um, kind of more information, more knowledge, to help refine the program as it went along, to test those assumptions. Um, and if that, you know, in terms of program design, that sounds great. Okay. Um, what I'm going to talk about is where the kind of ambitious, kind of learning-focused program design hits the reality of a number of pressures which constrain the ability to refine and adapt in, in light of what's been learned. So first off, um, the evidence-free assumptions about tech in the original program were not in reality open to serious contestation. Contesting them would have challenged actually some of the core functions and setup of the program. And that wasn't something that was really open to question. Um, so they were things that were, you know, the consortium partners were particularly wedded to or particular donors were wedded to particular approaches and actually having a, a more uh, contested conversation about what those things look like and the best approaches to use, um, that wasn't really on the table at a number of points. Um, so at the start of the program, in the interest of quickly issuing an open call, and starting to disperse grants, we were told actively not to work with innovation and scaling grantees to develop project level theories of change. While doing so would have been costly and slowed up, would have slowed up the granting process, it was also a missed opportunity to really appraise and help the development of more realistic proposals. 
and also identify much more appropriate ways of measuring the kind of outcomes and impacts of those initiatives. Um, we also experienced a number of tensions around log frame indicators. We all mentioned log frames, our eyes roll, but actually at some points they can actually be a useful program management tool. Um, these indicators were drawn from the program's theory of change, but didn't really differentiate between the diversity of the kinds of work grantees were doing. So throughout there were tensions over um, you're comparing apples with oranges. You know, there were, there were particular indicators around reach, engagement, which weren't necessarily, um, the projects we funded didn't necessarily speak to those, those higher level aggregate um, indicators. So for example, if you were trying to re reach huge numbers of people, reach figures, it's really important, quite a useful measure. But if actually what was gonna make the difference was quite, you know, very careful political intermediation. You know, what is it that you're measuring there that's useful? Um, so, this led to a number of problems. Um, and I'm just, in the interest of time, going to skip over some of those. Um, okay, now let's get into it. We've got, yeah, okay, good. Um, yeah, so some of us took the position that actually it was really important to measure the things that mattered. Okay, so ma maximizing reach, engagement, what weren't necessarily the most important things. Okay, so our position didn't actually hold that much sway when there were particular political drivers that meant having those top level figures, although meaningless in a lot of, a lot of cases, were needed to make the pol political, political case particular at donor level. Um, another kind of issue around kind of indicators and reporting was around um, being able to produce gender disaggregated data. It's, you know, we're, we're all very keen to be able to demonstrate that our work um, results in, you know, greater gender equity, but actually a lot of the theories of change behind some of the projects supported relied on the perceived privacy and anonymity that the technology offer, um, options offered them in reporting problems. So not having to go in in front of perhaps the person you need to complain about to you know, go and put something in a suggestion box, you know, there's quite a critical part of whether people might engage with that technology or not. Um, so in some cases, we were, we were under a lot of pressure to produce that gender disaggregated data which was counter to the theory of change of the particular project. Um, halfway through the program, there was an opportunity to revise some of those log frame indicators. We all agreed that actually some of these things weren't particularly useful as an indicator of what different projects were achieving or not. Recognizing the problem, the, the problem of the kind of apples and oranges issue say, so, okay, perhaps these aren't the right things to be monitoring. But again, there's, there, was a, there was a problem whereby some of our donors needed to have a time series across the entire, entire program where you've got consistent indicators for four and a half years so you could see the pattern over time. And it wasn't politically acceptable to not have that. Um, and then finally, I, I just wanted to talk about distortions. Um, and the program contained multiple incentives to distort or fudge or grossly simplify or dumb down um, all the way up and down the A chain from individual grantees proposing what they were going to do and framing it according to perhaps an oversimplistic framing that the program led with, um, or actually you know, re reporting on what did they say they did versus what did they actually do? Yeah, I've got one minute left. Um, or consortium members in terms of filling, filling out log frame indicators or reporting up or down. Um, through to donor representatives themselves having to uh, have conversations with you know, the very top level of, of ministries. Um, so 
I think we'd all agree that learning is a really important thing in, in terms of improving our practice, um, but we need to recognize the quality of evidence on which learning is based. Um, just throwing it out there as a question, how many in the room would be happy to educate your kids based on facts derived from the content of grant reports? <laughs> mull over that question. Three very quick takeaways from this. Um, the first one, civic tech clearly fulfills that central principle of development theory that was famously summed up by Andrew Natsios, who I think had just finished being the administrator of USAID, which he was for four years in the early, 20, the early 2000s, that those development programs which are most precisely measured are the least transformational and that those which are the most transformational are the least measurable. Secondly, the organizational culture and drivers of donor-funded innovation programs are very often in multiple tensions with painstaking evaluative approaches that are needed to assess impact in governance work. Some donors do find these tensions easier to resolve and navigate than others, but the tensions are definitely there. And thirdly and finally, although it's harder, governance impact is not unmeasurable. I really don't want the takeaway from this session to be, oh, you just can't measure governance impact. There's a whole literature, there's a whole body of experience on how to assess impact in governance work. It's just located in different fields from most civic tech work. It's located in the governance field and in the, and in the development evaluation literature. But um, in MAVC, given how the, the highest prioritized log frame indicators were going to tell us very little about the extent and mechanisms of governance impact. We did later on in the program start using some of these methods, probably too late for it to be maximally useful, but there are lots and lots of approaches to doing it, and I think you know, this is a call for the civic tech community to start turning to those methods and start to use them to evaluate their impact better. Ultimately, the field needs to take some steps to avoid letting the least transformative work be the best measured. Okay, so thank you very much, both Rosie and Duncan. Very interesting talk. Thank you.